Hello and welcome to Everybody Pulls the Tarp. I'm your host, Andrew Moses. With me today, a very special guest, Rebecca Smith, the founder and CEO of Complete Performance Coaching and Perform Happy. Welcome to the show, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. It's an it's an honor to have you. Rebecca, uh, you know, we, we've spent some time talking the last few weeks. And what I have learned about you is, is your amazing story and, and all the great work that you've been doing for 20 years now, helping high achievers achieve maximum performance and maximum happiness. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I love the work you're doing and I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into it all with you. What I wanna do though is um, look, look a little bit further back in your, in your career. So your passion is teaching young athletes and their parents how to achieve that peak performance while also that maximum level of happiness. Where did it all begin for you? Ah, so I was a gymnast. I was a, and I was the, I'll call myself the head case gymnast. I was the one who got so nervous on beam that I would shake, I would convulse and then end up with a really low score because they counted off wobbles because of the amount of shaking I was doing. I was, I got so nervous And then, and usually gymnasts will have one, they'll either be the kid who's fine in practice and nervous in competition, or they're fine in competition, nervous in practice. I got to be both. So I was also nervous in practice and I would have these skills that I, that were well-trained. I had already won competitions with these particular skills. And then some days they, I couldn't do them. It was like this physical sensation of, I can't, you know, I try to go backwards into a skill and sort of hit a wall. My coach is like, okay, do it. What's the problem? And I was like, I don't know what the problem, I don't know why it won't work. And so, and of course, other athletes had these in my gym, other, other, they would have this like, oh, I'm, I'm afraid to go backwards, but I felt like I was the only one who would have this crazy sensation of, oh, I can't tumble today. It's not working. I don't know why, and I don't like it, and I'm going to try to force it, and I'm going to try really hard, but um, I'm getting yelled at by my coaches because they think I'm not trying, or my coaches are like, sure, I'll stand there again and again and again for you to do this skill you've already done well so many times, so it just wore me down because I felt like I felt like I was like walking up the down escalator. And I was just working so hard and trying so hard. And like, I had this really good attitude and I really wanted to be the best athlete in the gym. But then my teammates, these little seven-year-olds were like up the up escalator. And I was like, what the heck? And then the idea of getting even bigger skills just terrified me. And I, and I ultimately didn't believe in myself enough to think I could keep doing that to reach my goals. So you so dedicated that, your so you dedicated your life to ex- exploring these types of challenges. Yes, exactly. So I quit at fourteen, and immediately started coaching, because it wasn't that I ever fell out of love with gymnastics. It was that I fell out of self belief. Like I didn't think I could do it, but I believed in other people. So I went and I started coaching, and I coached for fifteen years. And I and I had kids that had the same phenomenon happen, and I was like. Like, come on, what are you, why are you being lazy? Try harder. If you don't do it, you have a rope climb. And I I was like, whoa, wait a second. I'm doing the same thing to them that my coaches did to me that did not work. And I was like, okay, I'll stand there again and again and again and again. I was like, that didn't work either. So I, so when I went to get my master's degree in sports psychology, I was like, I am going to figure this thing out. Like this, this is driving me insane. And I need to know why this happens to athletes. And I need to know why to fix, how to fix it. And so that is, that's sort of where the, the journey with my particular specialty started was like, I'm going to figure this thing out because I don't want that one or two kids in every gym to be feeling like I'm the only one and I'm broken and I can't do this. So tell my audience what you're doing today. Cause it is, is an absolute, um, it's an absolute awesome story. It, it's a great company that you have formed and I couldn't do it justice by describing it. So what, <laughs> t- t- tell, tell the audience a little bit about what complete performance coaching and perform happy is. Okay. So I, yeah, so I started a coaching company and basically worked a lot with, at, with gymnasts because that's who I intimately understand, but it's, it's a lot of, um, individual sport athletes, primarily junior, like intermediate junior level athletes who have the potential to go collegiate or elite 
Um, and so I, I have a team of coaches and we, we work with athletes to build confidence, overcome mental blocks. A lot of it is dealing with performance anxiety and essentially it's unlocking their confidence so that they can believe in themselves, trust themselves, believe that they have worth beyond just outcomes, because that's what I found is the, is the root of the problem for a lot of these confidence dips is that they don't they don't believe that they can. They are working hard. They want to, but they they have these certain things underneath that are keeping them small, that are kind of self-sabotaging. And what? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I mean, so we just like we we get into that in a couple of ways. One is the one-on-one coaching. And then we also have this this online community, which is where that one head case kid in each gym comes together. And I use that lightly because I I adore these these girls and these guys and they they come together and they're like all right let's break through this together and then they get the focus off trying to please their coaches they get their focus on progress staying present and then they learn all these lessons that that go so far beyond sport but they also allow them to get their skills back get their confidence back in a way that lasts and then become you know like a a giver to these other athletes who are, who are still struggling, they give back so that they can kind of keep the, uh, they can keep the good mojo flowing. What, what do you think today is the biggest challenge for youth when it comes to competitive sport? Oh my gosh, the biggest challenge. I want to say it's an outcome focus because that, that is so it's, it just eats away at everything. And I know that doesn't make any sense because like, if you're looking at collegiate or elite athletics, you want to be perfect. You want to be amazing. You want to set goals and reach them. And that is, it's an important part, but I think what gets lost in that focus is that if I don't get this skill that I need by this day, I am not okay. I am not measuring up. I am not good. So then they lose sight of the journey and that whole process of, of expanding the comfort zone and pushing your edges and, and they they get to a point where they feel like, oh, I'm just not good enough because I'm not I'm not going fast enough or I'm not hitting every goal, which it just it undermines all that hard work that you're doing. Is, is it that there's a standard program that that you know everybody's supposed to almost comply with, right? If if you want to be an elite gymnast, you've got to be mm-hmm. here by here, you've got to be here mm-hmm. by here, you got to be is, is, does that yes. structure create oh, part absolutely. of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's like that. You nailed it. That's exactly it. I don't know any other sport where an 11 year old girl knows what college she wants to go to. An 11 year old girl has already got her sights set on UCLA or Oklahoma or, and she's already a level eight training nine. She's already training 20 hours a week. I mean, it's, it is, I don't know of many other sports that, that have that amount of focus on the end goal at such a young age but then it's so easy to fall short. And I also, I worked with a swimmer who's 12 years old and she's like, I'm too old. I'm already, I'm too old. I'm like, girl, you are 12. You are not too old for anything. You're literally not too old for anything. I mean, like maybe for um, the five-year-old age division and dance camp, but like, that's about it. <laughs> but the, there yeah. is that, like, I'm too old. I'm not making it. I'm not cutting it. It's, uh, it's so much pressure on these little these little minds. It sure is. And you and I have talked about that this show is called Everybody Pulls the Tarp. And it's all based upon a philosophy that I have, that great teams and great organizations are powered by individuals who contribute beyond the boundaries of what's expected of them, outside their job description. They contribute in unexpected ways. How do you go about helping young athletes set the right expectations for themselves? Mm-hmm. So this, I mean, one one of the main things that I um, that I encourage in order to kind of get back your power, get back your voice, is communication, and that relationship that the athlete has with themselves and with their coach and with their parent and with their teammates is critical. That's what that is what's required to to have um, to to unlock the ability to be happy and successful. You must have quality relationships within your team, which is interesting in individual sports where you are technically competing against your best friend who you train with all the time. You know, it, whether it's swimming or figure skating or you know any of these individual sports, you are competing against your best buddy and your coach is coaching two competitors and maybe coaching them differently. And so that 
opening up the lines of communication, especially with a coach, is the key. Because then if, like, let's say an athlete is stuck and they're like, I don't know why I can't do this today. I wish, I I, I feel horrible if they're like, I'm just going to keep trying harder and hope I don't fall apart and start crying. That's the typical strategy. A strategy I recommend is that you immediately walk over to your coach and go, coach, <laughs> this is what's happening in my life today. I I'm not, I, I don't know what's going on, but I'm not feeling myself. Can you help me come up with a plan so that we can work together and get out of this? And I- inviting people in, I think for the, the highly competitive athlete is a challenge and something that actually gives the coach an opportunity to then help you pull the tarp. You know, a coach cannot help you if they don't know what's going on with you. That's right. They can't, they can't go above and beyond if all they see is that you're in a bad mood over there not getting anything done. So I think we have to allow people to help us in order to create that entire, that environment of, of support. Well, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's almost like what you're suggesting there is this, is this vulnerability. And, you know, we have, we have personalities from sports, from entertainment, from business who, who come on this show and they're all highly successful people like yourself. And, you know, it's interesting. We've talked a lot about the environment that we're right now, that the, the COVID-19 pandemic has put let's let's just say people in the business world right instead of having your meetings in a, in in conference rooms and having the kids at school and a, working in a quiet home office we're we're kind of all commingling our professional and our our personal lives as you and I have have talked about a lot in our own <laughs> worlds um and what's what's interesting to me there is that i i i find that people find better success when they're just vulnerable and honest right hey i'm not going to be able to do x y and z by the end of the day today, because of I got all this other stuff going on. And generally, mm-hmm. it seems like when you're open and vulnerable and transparent, people are understanding and it puts you, you know, it, it takes you off your heels and uh, puts you back into a proactive position. It's very interesting how you, you mm-hmm. uh, how you describe that. So really what you're saying is this open, transparent dialogue between the athlete and coach mm-hmm. can help kind of reset expectations and put everybody in a better place to succeed and go above and beyond. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because because you have to start where you are. You have to start at point A. And if not everybody knows what point A is, then it's everybody could get disappointed or frustrated. But if you if if coach expects point A for you is where you left off yesterday, but it just isn't, then there's going to be a mismatch of expectations. There's going to be upset. There's going to be you feeling like you're failing, them feeling like you don't care instead of going, "Coach, point A is this." Straight up. And that's hard. Like you said vulnerability that is so hard because I mean, not all coaches are safe. I mean, I would like to think that they are. And that's something that's part of my mission is like, let's get safe coaches. Let's just stop being the, the, the coach that says, if you don't go, if you don't do this thing that terrifies you, you have a rope climber, you're going to be punished. Like, Oh, we got to cut that off. But, but if coaches can create an environment where it's, it's safe for athletes to come to them and encouraged and even practiced, like, let's have a lineup and check in. How are you feeling? How was your day? How's your family? No, I don't all have time for all these things, but I think it's time well spent to, to create that dialogue. Do you, do you think a coach can create positivity or is, or, or do you just come into the environment? You're either a positive person or you're not a positive person, right? So you, an athlete's either positive or they're not positive, or can a coach influence them and create positivity? So I had an athlete that I coached when, like way back when, and this kid was like the definition of attention seeking to the worst possible degree. I mean, she was like, watch me, watch me, watch me, watch me. And I'm like, it's nope, not, nope, no, it's nope, still not right. Nope. uh -uh, That's not it either. And I like, I would go, I was like, oh my gosh, this kid, she like wouldn't pay attention and then was super negative. And I was just like, I don't know what to do with this kid. She's going to drive me insane. And then I, I made a decision as a coach to switch my focus. I was like, I'm going to only acknowledge the improvement, the progress, the what's going better, what's going well. The only thing I'm going to even acknowledge, I'm not going to give her corrections. I'm just going to start pointing out what she's doing well. I just made that conscious decision for myself. And then guess what happened? She starts making more positive corrections. She started because that's what she craved. She wanted the attention. She wanted the connection. And so when I stopped pointing out, like, stop talking, get back on the beam. Like, what are you doing? Instead, I'd just be like, Hey, that was better. Look at your toes. They're pointed. Good. Then she was like, Oh really? And then she started working her butt off to get those compliments. So I think you kind of have to know your, 
audience, but I, but a lot of the time that's, that is what humans want. They want to connect. They want to be heard. They want to be seen. So if you can give that to them in a positive way, they're going to want to do more of that for you. They're going to be inspired to do more of that for you. Do you, do you think that applies, you know, beyond sport to, to business? Can, can CEOs get more out of people on their team by oh my gosh, people absolutely. doing positive things? Absolutely. And creating an environment of, there's this concept called a growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And it's um, Dr. Dweck is who, who came up with that concept. But a fixed mindset is like, we only have as much talent and we only have as much um, intelligence and we only have as much friendliness. Like we, we basically are, we're, we're given this hand, we're dealt this hand and like here, this is who you are, Andrew. And this is who Rebecca is. And this is like, you're only this funny and this smart and this talented. And here you go. Good luck. Make the best of it. That's a fixed mindset. And so then we as employees would be like, okay, I can't let them know that I'm not as smart as I think I am. Or like, I have to like really but of course, if it goes outside of my abilities, like there's no chance. I just can't do it. I give up. Versus this the idea of a growth mindset where you 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 start at point A and you just move forward from there. And you just get a little smarter every time you you rise to a challenge. You get a little funnier every time you like get out of your comfort zone and tell a better joke. You know, like you that everything that you're given is just a starting point. And then from there you can grow. That's the way that a lot of teachers are starting to move. That's the way that that I think I think all individuals, if we can go from a place of like, it's not that I was born this smart and I got to max it out or I'm or I'm stupid or it's that I have what I have today. And if I keep working at it, I will get better. And that's what that's what we want to encourage. And that's what I encourage with my athletes is like, oh, that's better. An inch better. An inch better is amazing. And we throw a party. And then we go for another inch and then it's awesome. And like, let's keep after it instead of, you know, looking at it like, oh, you're not there yet. You're failing. So, so a lot of, you know, I mean, business leaders, anybody in sport, entrepreneurs, whoever it is, right. Might ask, okay, do we set the goal and then figure out all the little mm -hmm. things we need to do in, within that growth mindset to achieve that goal by a certain date? Or do you throw the goal out the window? Because for example, right. Mm -hmm. If I decided today that I wanted to be, uh, an, an, an Olympic track star. It would not matter. The coach I had, the time I invested, I just don't have the speed. I don't have the talent, right? There's just, so how do you go about setting a goal that's realistic versus a goal that is, you know, not ambitious enough? Yes. So there's the, uh, there's another concept that a lot of my work is based on. It's called flow theory. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's this, some people call it the zone. Some people call it, you know, it's that like that state you get in when you are just like killing it. You are completely present, you know, whether you're writing or you're doing art or you're doing a sport or you're running or you're speaking, whatever it is that you're doing, you're performing and it is flowing. And you're you're so tuned into your body that you're not you're completely out of your head. You're not insecure. You just you click in and it just goes. And you could you kind of look back at it and you're like, what just happened? Like that was exactly I've trained all the, all this time for that experience. That requires a challenge skill balance. So you have to have the right challenge. If you are, if your challenge is too low, you're going to get bored. You're not going to be inspired. If your challenge is too high, you're going to feel like you're failing and you're going to give up. But if that challenge is just a teensy bit out of reach, just a little bit out of reach, like the within the realm of possibility, you could do it, but it's going to take all of you. That is where that happens. And that's so, sort of how we want to orient our, our day to day is to like, let's just stretch it just a little bit more today. Well, I'm thinking about all the tarp pullers out there that are listening, right? And they're thinking, how can I contribute in unexpected ways? How can I make contributions to my team, to my organization? Um, to this project that I'm working on that go above and beyond the expectations. But when, when I think about what you're talking about there, they have to be realistic about what they're going to contribute. They have yeah. to do a little bit better than they did yesterday. They have to find that that flow, as you described. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's one thing for me to like write $5 million business on my whiteboard and then be like, cool, back to normal. Like it's that's not enough. <laughs> you know, instead I need to know, okay, well, for June we're going to stretch to here. And for July, we're going to stretch to here. And so we, yes, we set that, you, you set out the goal and then you plot the points along the way. And then within that, 
you stay micro focused on your progress and you stay really excited about your progress instead of a lot of high achievers, myself included. I don't know if you can relate to this, but I would look at that 5 million and be like, I'm failing. I'm not there yet. Oh gosh. How am I going to ever get there? Like, oh boy, this is, you know, this June to that, that's crazy. But if I'm just like, well, you know what, for, for July, this, and for August, this, I can stay really laser focused. I can dream my butt off. I can be like, I can dream to all heaven. Like, I want to go to college. I want to go to UCLA. I want to do this. I want to be an Olympian. Like, yes, dream it, plot it out, and then get super laser focused on just what you're doing right this second. Because also you cannot be in flow if you're in the future. Flow is only in the present. If you okay. think about the future or you think about the past, flow is done. You're out of the flow state. You are so in the zone that you're working on essentially some micro, micro goal or objective. Mm -hmm. Yep. You're just executing. You're just executing. And that's that's the kind of the end game for, for my athletes is that we get to the point where you no longer have to do all the affirmations and I got to breathe five times. And it's, it's more like you just click in, your mind gets calm and you go and you execute. And, and that creates this, you know, this positivity that will propel you onto the next one. Oh my gosh. Flow is the best thing ever. It's the best thing ever. You, if you tap into flow, you're like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. I want more. And then you're like, what, how hard can I work? Because I want that. And that's the athlete who's like, they're, they're pulling the tarp harder than anybody else. And they're like, let's go team. Like, this is awesome. I love my sport because you have those moments where you're like, oh, all of the hard work paid off, clicked in. I did what I'm fully capable of. And I want more of that. And that's right. where that, that internal drive takes over and it's not, it's no longer about like, yeah, medals are great and flow gets you medals. But if you're, if you're in pursuit of the flow for flow's sake, all the rest of it is just cherry on, just a cherry on top. Where do you, so all these high achievers, right, can work so hard on whatever they're working on that at some point it's liable to not become fun anymore where mm -hmm. the fun escapes you for a period of time. What tips do you have for people who are really passionate about something, whether it's their business that they've started up, the team that they're working on, the sport that they do, whatever it is, being a, a, a great parent, and they just feel like they've they've lost some of the the joy and they're just kind of going through the motions. But do you have tips, you know, little things that you can do to just inject a little bit more of that that fun back into it and remember why you were doing it in the first place? Oh boy. So the first thing that came to mind when you're asking the question is I interviewed Olympian Jonathan Horton. He's a men's gymnast. And he, he said that the two years before the Olympics were the worst years of his life. They were the hardest. They were the most grueling. They were the most sacrificed. They were like, he, he, he said like, it was awful. It was hell. It was a hellish couple of years. He was coming back from injury. It was just like, nothing was going right, but he was like, I'm going to the Olympics. So we're just going to do this. We're just going to wake up and we're going to put one foot in front of the other and we're just going to do this. And then he ends up at the Olympics. It's an amazing moment. He medals, he's on the podium and he's got this like, ah, oh, it was all worth it. You know, we, we don't all get like that, that, that realm of life, especially in parenting. I'm like, where's my, where's my podium parenting in a <laughs> pandemic? I need a flipping po podium about now, but but I mean, so there's a couple things. The first thing that I hear a lot of athletes talk about when I ask, like, was there any moment where you wanted to quit? Was there any moment where you're like wondering, is it worth it? Every one of them says absolutely definitively yes. There were moments where I did not want to do this anymore and it wasn't fun and my body hurt and I didn't know what the heck I was doing anymore and like if it was worth it. But they had a dream and they had a dream that was bigger than the pain, than the, the suffering, than the sacrifice. And that dream propelled them forward. So there's, there's that, that's sort of like macro level. If you have that dream that you're like, yeah, this is what I want, like farmhouse on five acres, you know, or whatever it is for you, that, that dream allows you to sort of like trudge through the day to day. But then in the day to day, you don't actually have to suffer pain. What is it? Um, pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. Things are going to be hard. Things are going to be challenging, but it's, it's a matter of perspective, how you, how you go through it. You know, and you can look at 
for example, a disappointment. We have all had a lot of disappointments recently. I can venture to guess, you know, with with COVID and shutdowns and quarantines. And I, I was expecting that both my kids would be in school mid-July and I could have all this peaceful time to work. And now I'm like, more kids, okay, more babysitters. Like, how are we going to, There's so there's a lot of disappointments. But what we want to do is see if we can figure out, okay, what's the silver lining? What is the, and I know that's like, kind of contrite, but to be like, okay, I have these, have these two little girls home with me. I can either go, this is not how it was supposed to be. I'm inconvenienced. I can't work the hours I want to work. Like this, this is not what I was, this is not what I signed up for. Or I can shift my perspective to Monday. We went to the beach because we could, you know, like that, those sorts of things. It's to, it's to find the gratitude, to find the, like, well, this wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't have been for that disappointment. Those are the things that can like, it can just bring the glow back into your life. I mean, gratitude is the biggest way to find happiness in a situation that's really challenging. So if, if anything, it's like, just pull out your five fingers and five things you're grateful for, that'll reset you. It's actually proven to, to make micro changes in your brain every time you practice gratitude that wow. allow the happy chemicals to come out. I'm going to go count five things that I'm that I'm grateful for. One of them is definitely this conversation, Rebecca. This has been so much fun. I've learned a ton. We could we could talk for hours. We'll have to make this a a, a 10-part series one day with uh with Rebecca Smith. <laughs> so, before I let you go, where can listeners and viewers find more information about the great work that you're doing? So you can find us on Instagram at complete underscore performance. We also have a free Facebook group. So if you are a family who has young athletes, I would encourage you to join us there. It's called the Sport Confidence Accelerator Facebook group. Um, come join us. Find us on Instagram. Well, Rebecca, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Everybody pulls the tarp and, and best of luck. Uh, and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for the good work you're doing.